we talk about the propensity of the market to close on the highs or lows for the week. Well, folks, unless things change, we're going to be closing on the highs for the week. Thanks to what do you know? Tech. SMCI can save, be saved. iRobot. Oh, boy. 15 bucks now. Nate Tobik, 835 to talk about bank stocks. We're going to wrap up this week on pre-market prep right now. All right, pick it up right where we left off on the close, trading up 26 and a half handles near the highs of the session. Only one number, the high of the move, 48.4150. That will surely be tested today. Uh, the buck in the red by 17 cents, 103.14. Bonds up a quarter of a point, 120 and 5.30 seconds. Crude hanging out down 26 cents, 73.69. Gold up 14.80 at 2036 and 40 cents. Silver trying to get back over 23, 13.8 cents. That's higher, 22.94 and a half. And Bitcoin trying to end that losing streak up $465 and 41,345. Let's bring in Triple D, Triple D, SMCI. You talk about AI, you talk about tech, and the market listens. Um, SMC, SMCI listing, obviously, after the bell. Let's bring Aaron in here, too, for this conversation yeah. here. So bring AB in the background here. SMCI yeah. comes out after the bell and raises guidance, raises guidance substantially here. AB, I don't know if you have the pro open here, but you can yeah, go grab full, those numbers a, for us. A full buck on the EPS. So the original outlook was supposed to be 440 EPS a share. They raised that to uh, 540, in between 540 and 560. So... Uh, I mean, a substantial guidance raise here, uh, now expecting uh, sales of $3.6 billion, up from its prior guidance of $2.7 billion, so almost a whole billion dollars uh, in that quarter that now SMCI is saying. And I mean, it's like it's like the perfect company to be doing this with, with all what we've been talking about, Dennis, because it's super micro computer. Like you couldn't pick a better name for a company saying, yeah, of course, this company is doing well right now. Anything that has to do with chips, AI, computers, generative AI is, is just crushing it right now. Uh, yeah. and, and, and the market is obviously rewarding it. I mean, this stock doesn't, this stock is reporting earnings uh, in about 10 days on January 29th. So uh, you're seeing this big run up. I mean, before the company even reports now, I mean, this is what we talked about the other day, though. Is it better to kind of set the bar higher before the earnings or that we have you well, know, I mean, this is a preliminary report. So, you know, what they've done is they've come in here and they've raised guidance. So we now have a very good indication that this report in 10 days is going to be very good. Um, this is what we've talked about, though, is being, you know, long the story stocks for 2024. And, you know, what's going to be a story stock? Probably AI. So what do you have? 19 days, January 19th, you have one of the, you know, my NASA, one of my acronym companies. Raising guidance. You know, what does this mean for NVIDIA and AMD? It's probably good news. It probably means that they're busy and they're still, you know, and potentially going to raise guidance as well. So, I mean, if you look even the sympathy plays here, NVIDIA and AMD both trading substantially higher here. All the chips are trading higher here. Um, one thing, SMCI, it's got to get above that 357, not, that all-time high that made from six days ago. So that's going to be your first major point of resistance. I mean, the tape wasn't great for it yesterday here, but again, fundamental news driving the bus here. Stock is trading up 11%. It's a nice response to the raise guidance. The PE is cheap on this puppy. Again, is there pull forward? There's all those questions that we can ask. You know, same thing with NVIDIA. But I mean, this thing's trading 14 or 15 times earnings here. Um, biggest question is how much pull forward is there? 
a little bit of a leak. Uh, you did get up to 355, right? You hit that right 355 even just on the last half hour bracket. And you're nine points away from that. So it's going to be tough. I think you might have a good a hard time getting above that. Uh, Dennis mentioned the all-time high. All-time high comes in at 357.99. So if, in fact, I think it's going to take some heavy lifting to get up over that 355. Might be one of those scenarios like we talked about in Humana yesterday. You never got a chance at those pre-market levels, not even close. Uh, the low of the day was 10 bucks above uh, the low. So we'll see if that's the case here for SMCI uh, trading up 11% at uh, 346.49. NVIDIA, same thing. This is busting out new all time. I got to get rid of this retracement. This is uh, no longer relevant. Uh, and AMD trading a new all time high as well, I believe. Yeah. And I mean, the, the queues themselves, like you mentioned, Joel, just right there at the all time highs right now. So clearly, uh, you know, the market is telling you what it likes right now and what it likes is anything tech, chip, AI related again. And that's going to be the trend in the story. I mean, until it's not. And I think, you know, you can uh, you can try to fight it or not, but it's 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 right now. It's That's the clearly established trend. Well, I mean, the shorts are fighting this story. And this is, you know, why, you know, I made that acronym an AI story, because I believe there's going to be a lot of AI conversation in 2024. I don't think AI is going to go away. I think it's only going to accelerate. So one thing, you know, is by good companies are reasonable valuations, but you want, you know, the potential for a story here. And this AI story is not going away. So I think all these stocks are buys on the dips. Yeah. And speaking of that, Dennis, do you guys know what the most shorted, at least by some measure, the, the most shorted stock out of the Magnificent Seven is right now? Tesla? Nvidia? It's not Tesla. So yesterday, Microsoft passed Tesla as uh, from a notional value. So just total amount of uh, shares, not short interest. Because if you go by short interest percentage, it still is Tesla. But right now, I mean, Microsoft's a bigger stock, but there are more shares uh, held short right now against Microsoft than Tesla for the first time in like five years. So it's, it's people are, like you said, Dennis, going out and trying to short this play. No, this is so I want to teach you something here, Aaron. And, and Joel's going to know why. The reason you have so much shorts on Microsoft and Apple is because they're huge components of the S&P and people are just doing the, 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 the bots are doing the arbitrage. So, I mean, it's not like, oh yeah, I'm making a directional bet that Microsoft is going down. There's always going to be some shorts in stocks like Apple and Microsoft because that's how the market stays efficient. The cash gets a little bit too high. They short the stocks against the futures. The futures get a little bit too high. They buy the stocks against the futures. You're always flipping that back and forth with so much ETF arbitrage going on. Just taking that number at face value and assuming that all these shorts are directionally betting that the stock goes down doesn't understand market structure. I'm short Microsoft all the time because I'm doing the ARB too. I'm short Apple all the time because I'm doing the arbitrage too. So, But I'm long Qs or S&Ps against it. So it's not directional betting. It's just taking advantage of little micro market inefficiencies. So that's an important thing to understand when you're just taking. And people will just take the, the short interest and say, yep, we're going to punish all these shorts. And they understand that you know the majority of shorts in the market are simply doing different types of arbitrage, ETF arbitrage. Every time you list a new ETF, there's ETF arbitrage going on that keeps these prices in line, creation, redemption, all of that. So just taking this and saying, yeah, you know, everybody's betting on Microsoft going down is not the case. So, you know, so just try to understand when you get to the big companies like that, there's always going to be some people short those companies. I mean, we have, you know, lots of traders at Bright Trading, same thing, that do the ARB. They're short these companies. They're long these companies sometimes too. It all depends on the day and where it is relative to where the S&P futures are going. But I mean, all your algos, all your, you know, your citadels and all the ones playing the arbitrage are all going to be long or short depending on where the inefficiency is. So it doesn't mean that they're betting on Microsoft failing. Right. And I wanted I, I tried I wanted to make that clarification that still the short interest like percentage wise against Tesla was still higher. But I just saw that headline yesterday that now Microsoft. Yeah, that's what and, media and, does. Right. The, the, the headline well, the majority is still of media say, aren't traders. They don't understand. And you know what? Even if they understand that. 
they don't want to publish that. They want to publish a cool story that everybody's betting against Microsoft. Right. I mean, this is why the media is fake news, and it is. Well, to your ninety percent of the stuff out there, like people, you know, people will reach a stock price will move sometimes for a, a you know technical reason, maybe a technical breakout, and I'll get somebody calling me up and asking a reporter calling me up and saying, "Well, what is it?" And I'm like, "Well, this is technical breakout." They don't want to hear. They don't publish anything like that. They want to hear a fundamental story. People in the media don't want to hear anything about technicals. They want to hear that this is the reason. There was an analyst. They get commentary here or whatever. And they will often find a reason. If they have to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig, they'll find some fundamental reason. Even though it's not the reason, they'll publish that that is the reason. Because that's what the media, that's what people want to hear. That's what, you know, sells in, you know, papers and headlines. So just understanding, you know, that the majority of market moves, like somebody was saying, oh, these moves are all algorithmic. Of course, they're all algorithmic. The entire market is algorithmic. I mean, it's not just your citadels and your virtues. Every single institution is running algorithms too. Like they don't come in here and say, oh, I need to buy a million shares. Let's just buy them at the market and hope for the best. They work them with their little algorithms and they sift them in there piece by piece by piece. 200, 200, 200, 200, 200, 200. Starts showing up on the charts. Sometimes shows up in levels. We know Oxy, Warren Buffett is the buyer down in the 55, 56 area. There's a reason Oxy just doesn't just break down and die because Buffett still has his finger on the buy button. Buffett ever stops buying, that stock might actually start going down. But just, you know, understanding that institutional money, even though you don't see these huge orders out on the book anymore, still exists. Yeah, and it could be the futures. Uh, Eric M. mentions it could be the spy. And, All and, of it. So it, it could be... You know, someone doing a, there's people that doing an Apple Microsoft spreads. I mean, you know, you're going to tell me that, you know, if someone put a spread on at a good price, long Apple, when it got killed, maybe a short, a little Microsoft. They, I mean, they don't care. I mean, it's part of a position. It's part of a head. So um, also, I mean, for instance, here, too. Uh, go ahead, I'm Dennis. sure at IWM, I'm sure I'm just looking through my positions. I'm sure at a whole bunch of oil stocks and like, oh, my gosh, Dennis is betting on all these oil stocks going to zero. Well, no, I'm long XOP against, I'm long other stocks. So like I'm still trading at hedge. But if you just take those stats, I'm contributing to that short interest here today, even though I'm in, in a hedge where I'm probably rebuilding the ETF to a certain extent, not perfectly like, you know, Citadel or Virtu or some of these other companies that are doing the creation redemption. But, you know, it's amazing when you get three or four of the major components in there, your stock portfolio mimics that. So, you know, so when there's little inefficiencies, micro inefficiencies, be them pre-market after hours or even during the day or on the open and the close, there's opportunities there where you try to rebuild that ETF on a different side and you can maybe extract, you know, a fraction of a percent. We're not going in there. You know, these herbs aren't coming in these, you know, obviously, you know, doing ETF arbitrage, making 5%. They're trying to make, you know what they're trying to make? 0.01%, 0.01%. Or they're trying to make two cents, three cents, four cents. That's what they're coming in for. That's what keeps the market efficient, folks. Like that's why you know you have a two cent market in SPY. You wouldn't have that if it wasn't for the arbitrage activities. Uh, and to your point, Dennis, I mean, slightly different, but kind of similar with with the way the media reports on things and how a lot of people might not understand the full intricacies of the market. Uh, but when you see a headline like so and so's hedge fund was down ten percent last year, while the S and P was up twenty percent, and you think. How can this hedge fund be down 10% when all they had to do was buy the market and it was up 20%? Well, they were hedging. That's what they were doing. They were hedging. Their, their job wasn't to outperform the market. It was to provide a hedge for its investors. And so since the market was up 20% and their hedge fund was down 10%, they did their job. They were hedging. So a lot of times- well, and, that, and, and that, it depends on what the fund is. I mean, in some right, cases, of like course. I yeah. trade hedged. So you know, let's talk about my trading just for a second. I trade market neutral. That which is hedged all the time. So I'm not trying to extract alpha from the market just climbing higher, going lower. And people will often say, well, why do you do that? Why don't you just trade market? Why don't you just trade, you know, from the long side all the time? Because the market tends to drift higher and you would probably make more money. Well, that reason for the hedging is it smooths your earnings curve is that I'm doing this for a day job. I'm trying to make money, you know, on a consistent basis. If I was just invested long, like I am in my long-term portfolio, Stock market goes up 1%. I'm making, you know, a little bit less because I have a lower beta, like maybe 0.7. Stock market goes down 1%. I'm losing like 0.7%. So, I mean, I'm always moving around. I don't like losing money. So, I'm what my strategies are, and we talk about my strategies on the show all the time for 10 years, you know, 
um, is, you know, looking, you know, at breakouts, but not only just technicals, always looking at relationships and, you know, well, this is moving. So this is moving. Like last night when SMCI started to blast off, oh, right. it yeah. was probably fairly ones. obvious that chips were going to have a really good day, that NVIDIA was going to probably have a really good day, that AMD was probably going to have a really good day. Some people made some money just quickly running to NVIDIA and AMD. And it's not like SMCI reports and bang, NVIDIA is up 10, 10 points. Uh uh uh. Wasn't like that. It took a while. I mean, look at that move on AMD last night. It's slow and steady wins the race, slowly climbing. But if you were buying on that, saying supercomputer up 11%, probably going to be a good day for NVIDIA, which obviously, you know, we're talking customer, you know, one of the biggest customers of NVIDIA. Um, you know, it's predictable that NVIDIA is probably going to have a good day today. Those are the inefficiencies that I like. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, let's yeah. Move. Before we move on to the same news here, real quick, someone put in the chat about a quad witch. And come on, if you've been watching the show for a while, the quad witch only happens four times a year. That's March, June, September, and December. You do have an option expiration, so that will affect uh, stocks on the open. But uh, not a not a quad witch here. But uh, man, oh man, we got a big mover here that we should go to right now because this is just exploding. Spirit Airlines, give us the news on that. Moving. Yeah, so yesterday Spirit <laughs> announced that it was going to refinance some of its debt, and the stock uh, dropped about 25% at around, what was it, like 11.30 a.m. or something like that, Joel. Uh, and then, you know, kind of recovered throughout the rest of the afternoon. And then this morning, the company actually raised its financial forecast for the fourth quarter, uh, and now shares are trading up more than 20%. So Spirit said in a filing that it expects revenue to come in at about $1.3 billion at the high end of its earlier forecast. Thanks to strong bookings at the end of the year. Uh, I mean, like, who knows? Maybe they're going to say, hey, we're doing so well. We're not even looking to sell anymore. But the company actually did still say it supports the JetBlue deal. Um, but, of course, I mean, this has just been a wild ride in this stock this week. Uh, you know, wh where are we at in terms of... Of are, are we even are we like halfway? Are we at a fifty percent retracement from where we started? Oh, the week, man. Or are we still we, way lower gotta, than that. You know, I looked at this and uh, you know it it wasn't a buy like on the first day, the second day, and then yesterday it had the reversal. Uh, I think you got to. I mean, I'd be looking if you want to target here. Boy, oh boy, looking on the dailies, man. I don't know where you go with this thing. I would just say seven ninety two. Uh, is your three-day close. That was from the day that it got cut in half. So anyone that was buying the dip on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, I know just sent to me, uh, seven ninety two, eight bucks, nice round number, but uh, what a turnaround here for SAVE. This is just what attracts people. They want big money fast. It's the YOLO world. I don't want to sit around here and wait to make 5% in Coca-Cola. I want to make 25% of my money tomorrow. Save goes down. I'm like, I'm going to buy that one. It's going to bounce back. I mean, well, what the person I bought at 12, 10, 8, 7? You won't hear anything about them from me, though. You're going to hear about everybody who bought this at $4 yesterday, especially on Twitter because nobody loses on Twitter. So they're all going to brag how they all bought it at $4. But the person that bought it at $10 is going to be, you know, just Bridget. silent. So you don't even know they exist. But believe me, a lot more people have made a lost money trading save in the last couple of days than have made money trading save. So... Nothing. We This is all headline driven. Maybe the merger comes back. Maybe, you know, the regulators, which I tweeted out yesterday. I mean, we got iRobot doing the same damn thing. I mean, these companies, you know, are regulators coming in, blocking these mergers and these companies are flirting with bankruptcy. I mean, this is definitely not good for competition. So I think sometimes the regulators got to answer or, or, or look at the companies and say, hey, on a standalone basis, if these companies are in trouble. Maybe we should let some of these mergers go through. So I don't know if JetBlue is going to come back to the table. I don't know what the finance refinancing. I know this is a wild child right now. It's already traded 9.5 million shares in the pre-market. It's going to continue to be wild. So all I can promise you is extreme volatility in the stock. Yeah, and if you guys missed yesterday, well, uh, kind of a funny thing. Dave Portnoy was back in his started day trading again and announced that he was buying a substantial amount of Spirit Airlines stock. And within the same minute, Dennis, I don't know if you saw this, but literally within the same minute, thirty seconds later, the company announced that it was refinancing that debt, and the stock dropped twenty five percent. So he put That's in a bunch funny. of money to the stock, and then within the minute, you just see this huge red candle. But to his credit. He actually didn't sell or anything and stayed in it and maybe even bought some more. So he ended up 
uh, making most of his money back throughout the day. And now with today's price action is probably going to end up up on that trade. Um, yeah, AH, well, I, I mean, let's be honest here. Dave Portnoy, this is play money for him. I mean, we right. can say oh, it's a substantial amount of money because he takes those absolute dollars. I mean, what is Dave Portnoy worth? A couple hundred million at least, maybe more? What's probably, yeah, in? probably at least, you know, a hundred So if he million threw a million point. bucks or two million bucks in this, it's not even 1% of his net worth. So, I mean, a substantial position for me would be 5 or 10% of my net worth into something. So, I mean, we've got, that's media again going to drive and say, well, Portnoy is putting, you know, so much money into this. Is he really, or is he just playing around? And is he really, you know, he makes money in the long run just by, you know, Davey Day Trader being out back out there and driving headlines. Like even though Dave, you know, Dave Portnoy probably didn't do fantastic overall with his trading. I think he said that. How much did he help his own, Me, you know, yeah, yeah. brand? Right. It's yeah, way more uh, well, maybe maybe himself. maybe he took some, maybe he took some of those winnings he won from the national championship, Joel, and threw it into yeah, Spirit Airlines a, stock. He, I mean, he put a million dollars on he, that game. So yeah, that's I mean, a bag. I, I don't think he's hurting. So we talked <laughs> about Spirit Airlines trading higher into the open. We have some other stocks trading higher as well. Uh, Wayfair is trading higher this, this morning uh, after announcing layoffs, which is not the first time we've seen this in the past few months <laughs> where the market starts rewarding a company after it's announcing layoffs. So Wayfair is saying it's going to cut more than 1,600 jobs, 13% of its workforce. Uh, and I guess, you know, I mean, with the higher interest rates, look, the market's rewarding companies that are saying we're putting cost cutting measures first. We're going to focus on profitability. We're not worried about growth right now. And, you know, again, the market is rewarding that. I don't know if you're looking at this, how how the market is is acting toward these companies that are announcing layoffs. I wonder if other CEOs and companies are going to say, shoot, we don't even need to do layoffs, but maybe we should because the stock will go up 10%. We sometimes saw that Sometimes with... goes up. And in sometimes. the case of Unity, which we predicted correctly on this show, that when you start laying off 30% of your workforce, it sounds like other problems here. I mean, where's the threshold where... This isn't just cost cutting, but this is demand. This is seeing, you know, that the demand is not going to be as great. I mean, so Unity was trading up at forty-one dollars pre-market. It was still trading up at thirty-nine or forty, and we started talking about it. And I was still long the stock at the time. I talked about selling it because I'm like, I just don't think this is good news. And it opened that day. I sold the opening print that day at thirty-eight and a half, and now it's down here at thirty-two seven days later. So it's not always great news. I mean, this yeah, market the, is in a bull market, silver lining market. We'll find reasons to just buy stocks for, you know, whatever reasons. But I don't think it's fantastic. You know what I think is fantastic news? When you got to hire 1,500 people because you can't handle the demand. That's yeah. what I think is good news. But when you're firing 1,500 people because, one, your demand is not as great as you predicted it was going to be, and you're going to reward it 16% with cost cutting, I'm not a fan of coming in and buying this thing up 16% today. Yeah, a little bit of financial engineering here. I put a focus candle. You've already got a big pop off this. So we'll be looking at the 59.50 area. Really hasn't participated in the rally the last couple of days. A lot of people getting their money back. Uh, be watching 60. Uh, even in fact, if you can take out that pre-market high, I made this uh, the focus candle for today and also moving forward. You had a day where you had a high at 61.56, but you backed off to close at 58.79. So nice pop off good news here. If you're buying this thing off the open, which I wouldn't be doing, you better make sure you get a strong, you know, get out above that pre-market high, strong 60 bid here. Uh, as I said, a lot of people getting their money back here from uh, being down the stock in 2024, and uh, now you're oh, that was also the year. Well, the year end close was 61.70. So a pop on layoffs. That's not great news. Let's go to more layoffs here. Let's uh, just real quick go to the Macy's. Uh, there, how much of their workforce are they cutting, Aaron? Three percent. Wait, Closing isn't this getting taken well. over 21? Is it just getting taken over? Oh, yeah, Joel. $27, $28, all those real estate people coming, you know, and then they have to toot their horns and say, yeah, the real estate, we told you the real estate was worth $30. Well, they were telling us back that when the stock was 27 all these people are way down on their investment here. So $10 to $21, pulled back a bet. Macy's kind of in the middle of nowhere to me. I mean, uh, it's so interesting, though, for you to point out, you know, here's a company doing layoffs, closing some stores, and the stock gets crickets. Wayfair does it, and they pop the stock 16%. Storied stock, you know, Wayfair on social media, Macy's, nobody gives a crap. 
Yeah, I guess it just shows you that all layoffs aren't equal. You got to look no. in, like you said. I mean, if it, if it's Unity cutting 30% based on, you know, slower demand. Although looking at Wayfair's, it says this, re this restructuring is expected to save the company $260 million uh, and a lot of its corporate jobs. So maybe they're thinking, okay, hey, this actually isn't going to hurt our, you know, delivery of products and how people are shopping on, on the e-commerce, on the website. Um, but either way, again, so we, we've, we've gone to some uh, pre-market winners. We talked about Spirit Airlines. We talked about Wayfair. How about some big pre-market losers? Top of the list, disaster oh, of the day. Oh. I, robot, ticker IRBT, stock trading down. I mean, I think if you add in yesterday's price action, including today's uh, and today's pre-market action, it's down like 50% from uh, Wednesday's close. I, robot, the EU basically saying, hey, we're going to reject the deal with Amazon. Shares are getting absolutely hammered and this is again i mean this is a bigger storyline of the eu and uh, uh you know being willing to regulate these big tech companies like amazon meta google apple i mean the eu has made a number of rulings against these big american tech companies in the past couple of years that you know showing that it's not afraid uh to step in on some of these antitrust issues i honestly like what the irobot the little roombas the the vacuums yeah. like if amazon wants to buy those what I don't understand what the big antitrust thing is. I mean, uh -huh. it, it, it seems like if Amazon really wanted to sell or make its own little uh, robot vacuums that it could. So I don't know what the big, uh, you know, problem is here. But either way, uh, stock getting absolutely hammered this morning. Yeah, I mean, I don't get it either. It makes no sense to me. And it looks like iRobot's burning so much cash that without Amazon, it looks like this company is actually in trouble here now. Yeah. So we're just not in Kansas anymore when they took this company over. And Amazon's probably thanking themselves or thanking the regulators for not having to buy this. But I mean, what is it, a billion dollar deal for a $1.58 trillion company in Amazon? It's a drop in the bucket. It's absolutely ridiculous that antitrust regulators are not going to push this deal through, um, which is what it is. I mean, the pr takeout price is up at 51. It just goes to show you again, ring the register when these deals get announced because I was long I robot at $40, got taken over that next day back, you know, a year and a half ago. Stock popped to 62. I was like, thank you very much. Sold my stock around 61. And, you know, here it is at 15. So take the money and run. Don't sit around and wait for the last couple of percent on these deals because when you wait around, eventually some antitrust stuff starts to materialize here and these stocks fall substantially. So what, what, I think just now? sitting around waiting for those few percent is a good way to lose money. What do you do now with the stock? I mean, you do, you're off the free market. It's a, low it's a here. call option, Joel. Yeah. It's a $15 call option. You know, maybe the deal comes back to life. Upside is obviously up at $51 if this deal comes back and actually gets approved, but it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. Downside could be zero on this or at least bankruptcy. I guess stocks don't go to zero when they go bankrupt, but you know, let's say low dollars, like a dollar or two. If, you know, this deal really does die, I mean, I don't know if there's residual value here for iRobot. The company's burning a lot of cash here. Um, I don't know if they have other products coming that are going to turn this thing around. You know, they've talked about the, you know, the lawnmower for a very long time. I guess that's out there. But, you know, this company's burning a lot of money here. So it's just not in this good standalone situation here anymore, which is why it's down 34%. So there is substantial upside if the deal comes back i don't think it's going to though oh they won't um, do the deal at that pr i mean if anything i mean if anything I the deal price is a lot lower too oh I agree. yeah probably oh, they yeah. got some leverage here now to negotiate they already lowered it once they went from like 61 to 51 yeah probably gonna be like 25 or 30 but you're sitting here buying a 15 saying well there's going to be a deal eventually i know this is a good company is it burning a lot of cash man i don't know how good a company it is it's off the pre-market low at twelve fifty, so that's a solid three bucks. So if you're thinking down eight's bad, it was actually down eleven. Uh, now that feels like you know whatever the situation, whatever it's a zero, just based on the the price action, based off that twelve fifty low here. I think you find buyers on a decline. You are trading at your highest level since you made that twelve fifty low. But you know, I saw an, a headline on this and. Um, uh, there was an opportunity. I, I'd like to see what day it was. Oh, yeah. You had a heads up on this on Wednesday, January 10th. If you were uh, paying attention to your Benzinga Pro, uh, I robot shares are trading lower following a report suggesting Amazon has skipped a settlement offer with the European Commission for its deal with the company. They skipped a settlement 
hearing. That was nine days ago. So right there, I mean, if you're following the tape, if you're in this, you're Sounds following like they don't the care. news. Yeah, they were saying, yeah, so what? We're not going to spend any more legal fees. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, the only reason, like, if you're short in the stock, you think, you know, I'm just going to have my shark ninja. I'm going to use that. You know, just be careful because, you know, Amazon could come out and, and <coughs> say something that, you know, they're going a different route or they're going to sell some division or there, there must be something in there where they think it's anti-competitive. So be careful on that. Shark Ninja, that's the one they we talked about. everything is anti-competitive. That's the whole thing. Like, Listen, I, mean, I don't it understand like, it, it. Well, they're worried about Shark Ninja. They're worried about these competitors here. You know, like there's like one or two. I mean, if you're going to protect every single competitor and every single business here, we're never going to see a merger ever again. Yeah, and I mean, it's some of the stuff, though, I wonder. Do you, and by the way, do you guys, any of you guys either use uh, the iRobots or the, the Roombas? No. No. We have one. Lisa do bought it. It's sitting in. She, she used it a little bit when we got it. Now it's just sitting in the corner. <laughs> okay, so not in use. So you've got one. A, you've got a dormant robot in your house waiting to take yes. over. Not good news. I didn't it's buy a long it. I, it's just listen. It, all it's doing is listening to you, Joel. It's figuring out everything it needs oh, to yeah, know. Yeah. Then, um, but yeah, They're I mean, always I, listening. Which some of the stuff. I mean, it, as long to me, as long as it's actually beneficial for the consumer, then I'm fine with the EU doing some of this stuff. Like the only reason the new iPhone has the same cable now as everything else is because the EU said, hey, if you want to sell them here, you have to comply with this, which I think in the long run, that's going to be good for consumers that we're all on this universal <coughs> charging thing and we don't sure. have different things. But some of the rulings, like again, this one doesn't really make that much sense to me. And then you, you worry, okay, is uh, are they doing too much? Is it past that line of, okay, now this isn't good regulation. Now it's going too far. Um, Joel, who do we got coming on as our guest today? I know we've got some regional banks reporting this morning. Yeah, we'll talk yeah. About what a, as well. What a great day for uh, for Nate Tobik from uh, Complete Bank Data Report. Oddball stocks. Nate's our favorite. He's been guiding us through this banking situation. So let's go ahead and uh, bring on Nate here a few minutes early. All right, let's go ahead and give him our special pre-market prep intro. When we come back, we'll be talking to Nate from Oddball Stocks. Good morning, Nate. How you doing? Hey, good morning. Doing well. Doing really well. Hey, all right. Well, uh, I just, the whole interest rate thing, let's start with that before we go to the banks and the bank earnings. So rising interest rates were supposed to be good for banks and some of the banks rallied, but now rates might not be going up anymore. Now lower interest rates are supposed to be good for banks. They, Why don't you give us some clarity yeah. to that? Yeah, it's a... Uh... It, it's good if they go up. It's good if they go down. You know, I guess it's just a perspective. If you're always in the market to buy these things, uh, you know, there's always a reason to buy. Um, yeah, I mean, so what what kind of happened was uh, a lot of banks were really slow to move their deposit rates up. And they continued, it, at least in this environment, loan demand has still been strong. And so uh, banks continue to lend at a much higher rate and their cost of funds is uh, still relatively low. So uh, their spreads are, are still, uh, you know, still significant. And, um, and now what we're seeing is with rates potentially coming down, um, we're going to end up having, um, you know, a situation here where um, the, all those um, unrealized losses on securities uh, that, you know, we're a problem for banks are, you know, bond prices obviously trade inversely to rates. So now all of those losses are going to start to be whittled away and uh, balance sheet positions of these banks are getting a lot better. So um, in theory, uh, you know, a lot of banks that that did well managing that risk um, are, you know, they are kind of they're going to be the winners from this. Right. So uh, the, they get a boost to earnings. As, uh, as some of these securities come back and they've also been lending at a much higher spread. And so they get a boost from that as uh, as rates are gonna go down. Uh, obviously they're gonna move their deposit rates down as quick as possible. They're not gonna be hanging around selling 5% CDs when, um, when they could drop that as fast as possible. Nate, who are the winners and the losers here? I mean, it's there's so many regional banks and I can't tell any of them apart here. So that's why we bring you on here hoping to tell us 
yeah. little bit more about who the potential winners and losers are. Well, I mean, so I think the easiest way to, to start to pick them apart is to just avoid the losers. Uh, so if you look, um, you know, the the big uh, bank that laid an egg yesterday was Truist. And uh, so they came out and um, announced, um, you know, adjusted earnings were better than expected. But if you look at the, the actual numbers, they lost about five, uh, it's like 5.5 billion or something like that. And uh, that was due to a goodwill write down. So uh, so Truist is actually, it was the old bb and and SunTrust that merged. Yeah. And so um, I think what they're saying is, you know, whatever this, the merger synergies were that they, they thought pulling this deal together just don't actually exist and they won't be existing. And so, so they marked this down. And so, uh, you know, they kind of sugarcoated it like, Hey, this is, uh, you know, this isn't going to impact anything. We'll still be paying the dividend. Um, you know, it's a it's a nothing to worry about. Um, but they, you know, within that, if you also look, um, their reserve for losses uh, increased and their charge offs increased. Um, so, you know, if you you think, OK, so, you know, there's some maybe some credit quality issues, uh, at least with Truist kind of normalizing back to what we've always been. Um, if you look at Discover Financial DFS, uh, they um, they had a big miss, and a lot of that miss was due to um, credit quality issues. And uh, you know, if you kind of go back 15, 20 years, um, someone like Discover credit cards, uh, they're going to be their historic charge off rate is about five percent, six percent. That's just the percentage of people who they buy the big screen TV and they just never pay on that card. And it's, that's kind of the steady state. And what we actually had in the last couple of years is uh, those charge off rates were, were lower than ever. Um, you know, a lot of this kind of money coming into the system and uh, the load rate environment, people just weren't defaulting like they had been and we're starting to normalize. So um, their, their charge off rate went from uh, let's see, like, two percent to four percent last quarter and um you know that swung to a loss um they they noted that the lower end of their consumers were were sort of normalizing back to historical norms um so you know who else is a loser in this i think like so by um the majority of their customers fall into that uh the category of you know what what Discover says the losses are normalizing. Um, SoFi's never had a, they've never they were never around when charge offs were were at that normalized rate. Um, they're going to have some problems if if some of that normalizes. What about a firm? And everybody asks this. It's a retail darling. Stocks come well off the lows. It was back in November was seventeen or eighteen dollars. I just think about people like not paying their credit card bills, and I think about this a firm lending money to everyone. And I think about a lot of people, you know, not paying their bills on this. What What are your thoughts on AFRM? I, I, I mean, so it, it's the same as SoFi. I, I would not be comfortable in this stock right here. So there's, there's a cycle uh, we studied and it's the same with consumer credit and it's the same with mortgage credit. So uh, if you go back to year 2000 and earlier, um, when conditions are really tight, the only people lending on mortgages and consumer credit are banks. And then when things start to, uh, you know, all the pieces fall in place, a crisis is over, uh, other firms come in and they say, hey, there's so much money I could make here. And so what you have is um, you have a, an environment where um, non-bank lending for mortgages uh, gets to like 70 or 80% of the market and banks are only doing about 20% of the mortgages. And then that falls and flips. And so um, when rates rise in a crisis, uh, you get banks doing about 80% of mortgage lending because those other firms all went out of business. And it that cycle keeps repeating. And the same thing happens with consumer credit. So you see all these consumer credit companies when conditions are, are easy and loose uh, because it's easy to make money, there's no charge offs. And then they all start to blow up when conditions get hard. And the reason it, it works out for a bank is because that they're regulated and have to diversify who they're lending to. So you don't see any banks outside of 
you know, the, the credit card uh, banks like a Discover where 100% of their credit is going to Peloton bikes and financing a Starbucks coffee and all these other things. Um, so it's, you know, we just haven't hit that, that part of the cycle yet. Um, I don't know when that'll happen, but um, consumer credit is, is not a great place to be hanging out when when those things do start to change and normalize and you know based on what discover seeing that's already starting to happen now nate some of these regional banks i mean if you look at you know comerica who just reported this morning or a western alliance or like a colon frost uh, a lot of these regional banks are still trading uh you know lower than where they were at before the silicon valley bank collapsed last year in march uh, what would you be looking at in terms of of the of the bank's balance sheets and all these things to decide? Okay, this thing was kind of unfairly grouped in with the you know with the Silicon Valley Bank collapse, and there's really not those problems there. This is a buying opportunity, or would you just stay away from all these regional banking names? No, I mean it, the you know banks lag the market, and um, so in some ways this there's still a window of opportunity to get into a lot of these things because you're you're right they uh, they unfairly traded down. Um, if rates are cut over the next year, there's going to be a real big boost to these things. Um, you know, some of the some of these larger regional banks, if you look at some of their credit concentrations, um, a lot, you know, the questionable thing is all the uh, commercial office space. Uh, so a lot of times, if you kind of look at comps right now, most commercial office space is trading for less than um, where these loans were made. So, um, you know, there, there could be some credit marks on them. Uh, but the thing is, in a lot of cases, the tenants are paying, that's still cash flowing. Uh, yeah, the building can't be sold right now. But um, if everyone doesn't leave, and I think some, you know, you can make a strong argument that, um, you know, we hit, we already hit the, the lows from work from home, and people are coming back to an office. So if they're cash flowing now, um, and no one needs to unload the building, it's probably a decent, you know, it's a, it's a decent credit and that's going to be fine on the balance sheet. Um, you know, some of these banks are getting pretty innovative. One thing we've seen that's interesting is um, like PNC has been doing a lot of 40 year mortgages. And um, I think, you know, the idea is they want to get people into a house. Um, I'm sure the pitch is, hey, look, we could keep your payments lower and we'll just extend it out. Of course, you'll never have to pay for 40 years because everyone is betting that rates are going to drop and they can refi. And, um, you know, so we're seeing some of that. Um, it's, you know, it, it, I think if, if you stick with some of the regional banks, some of the bigger regional banks, like, I, um, you know, everyone's trying to cut costs. Uh, they're trying to dial things back to, to really, um, you know, fit what they think is a lower, lower growth market. Um, but if you look loan loan, the, the amount of transactions uh, year over year is actually similar. And, um, you know, this morning, the numbers came out that home uh, home home buying volume increased 4%, um, you know, January or December, I guess, year over year. Um, people are still out doing things. And so it's uh, a lot, you know, when you talk to a lot of bankers, the mentality is uh, they're waiting for the other shoe to drop. And it kind of, if you press them, the first shoe hasn't dropped yet. So it's like, we're wait, we're waiting for it to get bad, but it hasn't really been bad yet, but it might be bad. And we're preparing for that. Um, so, you know, in, in Mate, that we case, had you, yeah. uh, we had you back on in April, right? And uh, mm -hmm. things were looking bleak, SIVB and, uh, uh, you know, some of the other banks and uh, you were like that, you're like, you know, be calm. You know, don't don't worry. You know, things are gonna gonna be okay. And uh, sure enough, the KREs made a nice recovery. But I, one thing I remember you saying is that there's some loans on the books that are gonna be cut. Is it is it 25? Is it 26? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't there a isn't there gonna be a point in time when some of these big banks, small banks, whatever they are, they're gonna have to mark to market. They're gonna have, you know, is there or is they just going to keep kicking it like with the 40 year mortgage, just keep kicking the can down the road? Do you see a yeah. concentration of maturities coming up at the same time? that would be like, uh oh, we got a problem. 
Yeah, there. So uh, typically, commercial loans are a five-year balloon, and so uh, you know, mortgages originated in 2020, uh, 2021, low rates, and companies kind of paying interest rates. Uh, you know, that whatever the the low rates were uh, that they they were able to grab at the time. Um, and and yeah, at five years, they have to either pay it off or refinance the whole thing. And so there are, um, you know, there's a there's three year balloons that were popular three year, but five is pretty typical. So there is kind of a rolling period. If you if you look to say 2020, 2021, um, you know, three years, five years out from that someone's going to have to come up with the cash to pay either to pay it off which you know that stuff never happens or pay you know you're jumping from three percent to to eight percent and that that's going to be a big hit to margins for a lot of companies and so everyone's got their fingers crossed that it's not going to happen it's still a couple years away everything will change um i don't think that's going to be true you know if you think about interest rates, they've essentially normalized back to where they've always been historically. So, you know, back prior to 2008, having a five or 6% mortgage was just sort of normal. That wasn't a big deal. And so now we're back into that realm. Um, it, it's not unfeasible to say that, that we kind of hang around this level for a while. And yeah, at that, at that five year renewal for some of these, companies that's going to be a really big surprise because uh you know if they got credit at four percent previously there's no way they're getting getting it at that level again nate tolbeck he's at oddball stocks on twitter founder of completebankdata.com and the author of the bank investors handbook joining us here on pre-market prep to take a look at the banking sector Nate, we're gonna we're gonna dial you up next quarter. See how things are progressing in the banking sector. Thanks always for coming on the show today. All right, thank you. Have a great morning. Okay, uh, to the market here, leaky, leaky here. Oh man, right up to the former high of the move, forty one fifty. We went to forty one and a quarter. Now we backed off eight handles. Dennis, are you seeing any kind of imbalance jockeying here? Yeah, well, we're seeing a lot options of sell expiration. imbalances. Options expiration. We are seeing a lot of early sell imbalances here. So maybe some people taking some profits into the, you know, into the end here of the of the options expiration cycle here on the third Friday. Um, again, those things can change. So we know lots of institutional actions, institutions jockeying their open options positions against the stock. So sometimes what you see here. And imbalances at 849 is much different than what you're going to see at 9, 30, 40 minutes for these numbers to change. But right now, it's almost all sell imbalances. So I do think it's starting to take its toll on the S&P. Uh, one spot, you know, Nate mentioned people still uh, still buying houses and whatnot. Other, other, some other spending still happening. People still traveling. Let's go over to Travelers, ticker TRV, <laughs> uh, strong report. And I believe trading at, at all-time highs, Joel, I mean – uh, I guess, look, I mean, people are still finding money to, uh, to travel. Uh, it's an insurance company, Aaron. Well, they got travel insurance, so we'll give them that part of it. But... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. There's lots of businesses. This is a very broad financial services company. There's so many things that are in travelers here. Um, so they do a lot of different, you know, that, um, obviously insurance and you know what we see here is that you know all state travelers all these insurance companies have been very resilient i think it's just the steady cash flows that really attract a lot of investors and we know when it comes to like natural disasters and different situations you know sometimes these stocks can get hit you know if you got a pending you know hurricane happening or anything like that but for the most part the stock has just been you know a quiet steady performer it's not it has get been 40% a year, what? that's going to give you a little dividend, 1.92%, and usually a steady stream of earnings. Why are some of the biggest insurance companies like Progressive, obviously Geico is under the Berkshire umbrella, but why are those companies not, uh, oh, is Pro Progressive is uh, 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 publicly traded? I thought a lot of the big and biggest insurance companies weren't Well, Geico traded. is one of the biggest, and Warren Buffett bought that a long time ago. So oh, so it was public, and then he, he took it private? 
long time ago. I don't know when Geico was, I'm going to guess back to like 2004, 2005, like 20 years ago. But Progressive's another one. Flow, you know, they could get commercials, some of these. Um, again, there's another one sitting up at all time highs. Like I pair trade all these things together. Travelers, PGR, Allstate, they all tend to try, kind of track each other. So, I mean, I, that's what I've always done is just group stocks. You know, I group stocks, group stocks. And it's the simple things that people don't do. You know, they trade things, you know, independently. Well, I like the chart. I like the technical setup on this. I'm just looking at that. Well, if the other peer starts to show weakness signs or anything like that, that's an edge because other people aren't looking at that. So, you know, grouping your stocks. If I could teach anyone on their first, like, couple of weeks of trading what I would do, is would be group stocks. Group, yep. Take them and may, put them all in a groups. You know, if you're going to trade these 200 stocks, put them all in groups. Understand where they are. It's not good enough to just say it's financial services. You got to go farther than that, you know, because you have certain companies that are insurance companies that specialize in certain areas. You obviously have your traditional banks, you got brokerages. I mean, even just separating out, it's not just good enough to just say it's a financial services company and all financial services companies are the same because they clearly are not. Big move for travelers. You're also doing a buyback. I think, uh, I don't know how many option traders we have in this one, but boy, that burst at 212, it got up there on two different times. So there's a firm seller there. The longer it takes to get back up there, this is just a huge move for travelers. Yeah, the EPS, so. the EPS beat was pretty massive. It came in at $7 and a cent versus the $5 and nine cent estimate. So anytime you have an EPS beat of, that you know that substantially i mean it's almost like what 30 percent higher than what they were expecting you're gonna see that huge move and we've talked about we talked about this the other day with companies where the 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 expected move isn't supposed to be that much right and you end up holding those options especially on a day like today where they're expiring uh probably you know probably some people holding calls out there and travelers set to make some big money today um what, what is are we looking at the insurance uh s p insurance sector here? yeah Yep. I mean, some people are talking now about how it's it's getting a lot harder to insure, you know, houses in places like Florida or whatever. That insurance is getting like crazy expensive. Could there be some sort of fallout here uh, from people not being able to afford insurance? You kind of need don't it, know. I guess, if you're buying I a guess, house. Yeah. If you're buying a house down in Florida, like you 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 need. Well, that I mean, hurricane. health insurance is the biggest, you know, expense for everyone, and obviously, you know, there's some people that try to get away and you know, have limited health insurance or no health insurance. And that's just a scary thought. I mean, in some cases, yeah. The the bottom half, like, you know, as much as, you know, we can, you know, say, you know, S&Ps at all time highs, everybody's doing well. We know that's not the case. The bottom third, you know, has always struggled. And, you know, it might even be to as much as the bottom 50%, you know, have struggled here. I mean, and it's been a, what, what has happened really is just that gap between the wealthy and the poor has gotten wider. And that's why, you know, I have a lot of people upset. I mean, you know, there's a majority, you know, there's a lot of people that don't, can't afford to even own stocks. So, I mean, as the s and make new all-time highs, it's doing nothing for the person who's paycheck to paycheck, the blue collar worker that can't afford to save anything because they have all their expenses going somewhere else. So as much as we can say, oh, it's been such a resilient economy and everybody's just doing awesome. It's just not the case. The bottom third have always struggled. Yeah, right, and we, we talked to on, and uh, we just talked about the banks, uh, regional bank. Do we want to cover any of these regional banks? Yeah, let's go to Com let's go to Comerica ticker CMA reported earnings. Uh, okay, the stock coming back a little bit after the report. The stock was trading lower, uh, EPS beat, but the sales missed there for Comerica. Uh, sales came in at seven hundred and eighty-two million versus eight hundred and forty million estimate, but the EPS came in ten cents higher at one forty-six versus the one thirty-six estimate. So. Uh, when I checked earlier, Joel, it looked like we were trading down. Now it looks like the some buyers came back in. The KRE, which I know we were looking at earlier with Nate on, is trading up about six tenths of a percent coming into the market. So uh, I guess people are saying, "Hey, these regional banks." Like, but my whole thing with it was right. So with Silicon Valley Bank, it made sense. All of their clients were these high tech growth companies that couldn't afford the when that when the interest rates went up, they all needed to withdraw money at the same time. Silicon Valley Bank obviously had this hole in its balance sheet. But when you look at some of these other regional banks like Comerica, it's not like Comerica yep. is servicing only high-tech growth companies or Colin Frost CFR, which is one of my favorites in the space, is down in Texas and services a lot of oil and yep. gas companies. And it's like, why like, this thing's getting crushed with Silicon Valley Bank with a completely opposite customer base 
that is not going to have the same sort of withdrawal pressure. So I felt like they were getting kind of unfairly grouped in together, which Nate agreed with me. Uh, I still think like, I don't know if I'd want to own these things long term, just because I think the, the nature of the beast is that the big get bigger and, you know, Bank of America, JP Morgan, I'd probably rather own those for the long term. But I still think there is a trading opportunity here that these things will continue to move higher until they're at their more kind of fair market value with what their books are, which for the most part, between Comerica, uh, Colin Frost, Western Alliance, a lot of them are still trading below their book value right now. I mean, yeah, all these regional yeah. banks are in the same precarious situation that if interest rates were to go substantially higher, these loan books that they have on are, are, you know, significantly underwater. So if you want to know the trade, and I've been talking about the trade, it's the TLT and the KRE. It's the TLT in so many things. TLT, TAC doesn't care that much about the TLT. Apple doesn't care that much about the TLT. You know what cares about the TLT? The KRE. It cares a lot about the TLT because if rates start to tr climb up substantially again, all of a sudden we start thinking about these, you know, inverted loan books that they've got where they're, lending money at two and a half percent they're borrowing at four or five you know it's only so long you can do that they need rates to come back down actually that is why the kre has had a substantial breakout back in november it is not coincidental the tlt broke out from its lows put those two charts on top of each other tlt and kre they are virtually identical it's not always going to be the case it's not like the long-term relationship that tlt and the kre are completely correlated together but as of right now, because of this precarious situation they put themselves into, lending too long for too low of rates, and not every regional, they're not all the same, but a lot of them are, um, that's where rates matter. So they need the TLT to stop going down. You're not going to see a substantial rally in the KRE until the TLT starts to turn around and reclaim 100. But it's a slow, steady leak. It's not helping the IWM. It's not helping the KRE. It's not helping a lot of stocks that have, you know, a lot of, you know, XBI companies that borrow money. Do you not want to see the TLT continue to go lower? All right. The Co America, uh, that was one I did pick up uh, back in April and May. And it, it was just for the exactly what Aaron said. I'm like, <coughs> well, how much exposure uh, do they have to the tech area down in Texas? The oil people aren't. Uh, it not exactly running out of money here, but it's been a nice run for this, uh, man, major resistance over the $56 area, uh, but right now trading up 21 cents. So we'll see what these regional banks, I mean, what I think it'd be interesting what Nate said, if these, a lot of these loans are rolling off in, you know, five-year increments, 2020, we all know where rates were, uh, 2025. So Perhaps kicking the can down the road a little bit. Uh, continuing the leak here, this SMCI, uh, it is now the complexion of the market's really changed. Still up over $30, uh, but now 14 bucks off that pre-market high. SMCI, SMCI is a wild stock. The one it thing is. I will say, it is a very wild stock. It goes up 20 or down 20 on no news. So, you know, up 40 on this, then down 30. You know, it's got resistance. We know where it is. 355. Look where it got to again. I mean, resistance is very well defined on this. Sometimes you just got to trade things technically. And you say like, okay, the guidance is good. We know the direction. Now, where is the logical turning point? Well, I mean, the pre-market got up to 355 again. And that's where it got up to six days ago where it struggled. 357. If you go farther out on the charts on SMCI, that's where it got to. Back on uh, the 20, about going back into August of, of 2023 was that old high. So, I mean, resistance is very well defined up there at the 350 area. So, until it breaks out from there, you know, it's still the resistance is holding. Um, I've got it in the long term portfolio. I've got AMD and NVIDIA in the long term portfolio. These are not trades. I just feel like these companies are going to benefit from the continued movement into AI, which is why they're in my long term portfolio. But, you know, the path to get, you know, higher. I have no idea. This is a wild stock though, folks. And it's one, it seems like what's one you never need to chase. Yeah. I mean, AI was obviously the story of the market in 2023. And so far in 2024, that's continued to be the trade. Uh, your NVIDIAs, your AMDs, your SMCIs of the world have been rewarded. And again, I mean, you might, you're seeing some profit taking in this stock this morning. Uh, do you guys ever see this though, where you see some maybe profit taking in the pre-market session? And then as soon as the market opens, then you see, you know, some more buying activity, like, could this just be a healthy pullback? And then we're going to see more bullish activity. Or, or do you think we're not going to touch these pre-market highs? 
I, on with talk on SMCI. I I kind of think you can see the resistance very well defined. So I tend to think like the re, the the numbers were really good. You just got you just got to trade in technical here now. I mean, it ran up right to its old resistance point, has failed there. You know, can it you know regroup and try to retake those highs eventually? I hope so. I'm long in the long term account, but. I think Rome wasn't built in a day. And just to expect stocks to go up 100 points because they report good news is just unreasonable. So, I mean, it's all about reasonable expectations here. Because a company raises guidance 20% doesn't mean that the stock necessarily has to go up 20% that very next day. The markets just don't work like that. If, you, if you're buying a SIG off the open, man, you you gotta get, you better just look for immediate foul through. If you're wanting to short it, and you're just laying off the open. Maybe it opens 341 and a half, 342, comes back down through the open. Then, you know, you can lean on that early high. I just would note that uh, it just had a rough couple days. Uh, it had a one, two, three, four, five day losing streak going into report. So all the people that were buying into the report, whoa, I'm back at 340 here. Uh, so that's another thing that's adding to the yeah. Uh, you have yeah. overhead supply issues here. There's a lot of technical issues why the stock and people might be disappointed the stock's only up nine percent on this. Again, there's a lot of technical reasons why. To Joel's point, a lot of people underwater from the last four or five days. It wasn't trading good going into these numbers. Again, this may open up some eyes to some other investors, and they say. Hey, you know, this is benefiting from the AI movement here too. It's a company. It's not a huge company. Like it's not like one that gets talked about every single day in the media SMCI. I mean, it's AMD, Nvidia, those stocks get talked about all the time. But, you know, Apple's and your Microsoft's SMCI doesn't get a lot of headlines. So it's getting headlines today because of the guidance raise, but it's a quiet company. So does this put it on other investors radar? Maybe. Again, to Joel's point, major resistance up there and I think sometimes technicals just trump um, again, when, when you have a news direction pick, sometimes you just got to look at the technicals and say, where is a logical stopping point? I don't think you could have got a better logical stopping point than 355. Yeah. I mean, in terms of market cap, SMCI is about one, less than one tenth of the size of AMD and, and less than one hundredth of the size of, of NVIDIA. Small so certainly company. a small company compared to those, but I'm curious. I mean, my, I'm, I don't know. I don't know any reason for saying this really. I mean, you guys said the technicals. I feel like though, once the market opens, we're going to see some more buyers coming into this and, and we might be able to get back up to those pre-market <coughs> highs. Again, I think it's choppy. Gonna choppy. Be choppy. All right. So we got, we all have our predictions on it. Uh, Joel, by the way, I mean, you, you nailed the, uh, nailed it on the head yesterday with Humana calling that we were, uh, those pre-market lows were in for the day. So I uh, wanted to see if we could replicate the magic with another call today. But yeah, no, I, I, I said that when the thing was it uh, for the SMCI, uh, I went when it was like at 345. So uh, maybe just do a quick retracement of, of this move here from 355 to 342 so i don't know we'll see i mean i'll say this if it gets down to 330 i might try to swing it to the long side of you know before uh, the end of the day i don't know if we're gonna get all the way down there though uh okay. all right well it is 904 i probably won't trade smci today <laughs> yeah it'll be a little a little bit volatile. wild stock to trade well, we'll have some volatile stocks and this is it's why investing is so hard too i mean investing and and you know i've argued with people on twitter and they're like uh, don't trade. You know, Kramer said it again last night. You know, trading is basically he. You know, he keeps you know saying how you've got to you know hold good companies. You got to invest for the long run. Don't trade Apple. You know, own Apple. You know, he says it all the time. He poo poos. He's on a trading network and he just poo poos trading continuously. And there's so many people who are out there and that believe that every single day trader loses money. Every single trader loses money. And the truth is, a lot of them do. A lot of traders do lose money. But there are a lot of really good traders out there. So don't just pull the wool over your eyes and say nobody can make money trading. My entire life, my entire livelihood, every basic dollar that I've made for the most part, uh, like I would say 90% of my net worth has come from day trading. Not from long-term investing, but from actual day trading. Just, you know, doing, grinding it out, buying and selling, finding little edges, you know, finding inefficiencies in relationships, all of that. And it's real. And what I will also say is my day trading has always been much, much, much more consistent than consistent. my long-term investing. Yeah, because you log in, much you play more. both sides of the market. I'm, I'm working it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And when the market goes down, I do really well. And the market goes up, I still try to hold my own and still do pretty well. Um, again, 
just I don't want to like, you know, say that, you know, day trading is everything and every day trader is successful. I'm not saying that at all. It's a difficult business and you have to take your time to learn it and you have to find your edge. And your edge isn't just looking at a pretty chart and saying, well, this is, you know, what's you've got to go deeper than that. But if you have the time and you really think, you know, this is for you and you have the ability to learn and that's what you really need is, you know, you, you for, to be a good, successful trader. It's not about having this natural skill set like that's just, you know, instincts are helpful. But what really, you know, is is the success, what, why successful traders are very successful is they have the ability to adapt and learn. And they're willing to admit when they're wrong. So many traders will not admit they're wrong. They would just hold on to the loser and wait for the stock to come back forever. I mean, that's the majority of people out there. And that's exact opposite. I cut the losers, have very little time, little patience for losers. Um, Long-term investing is a different story. But from my trading perspective, you know, you get some bad news against you, get out, you move on, you know, and then, and that's the biggest thing is the discipline. So discipline and then the ability to learn. That's what will make you successful in the trading business. Got it. Well, Joel, who do we have coming on on Monday? The Cowboy. Scott Shalady, I don't know if you've ever been on with him, but uh, he always gives us uh, some great analysis of the market. So we uh, we got that to look forward to on Monday morning. Beautiful. Well, Dennis, Joel, thank you guys for a great, a shortened week. We only had four days of pre-market prep this week. Next week, of course, five. Uh, we'll be back on Monday. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Please smash the like and subscribe if you haven't already. We will be <coughs> back again on Monday. Till then, guys, stay green and have a great weekend.